Hello and welcome to the webinar. Today's topic, protecting your Microsoft 365 environment. This event is brought to you in partnership with Druva and produced by Actual Tech Media. Thanks so much for joining us on this special event. We've got a great presentation lined up for you and also a live demo. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'm sure that you are as well. Uh, before we get started, just a few things that you should know about the format of the event. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as your moderator. As always here at Actual Tech Media, we want these events to be educational, and we encourage your questions. I appreciate all the hello and good morning messages over there in the questions panel, uh, but we also want your technical questions on how to protect your Microsoft 365 environment. We'll be doing a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event today with our expert presenter. So keep those questions coming. We also have our best question prize, which I'll talk about here in just a moment to help shake loose some of those questions, if you will. Uh, I also encourage you to check out the handouts tab. It's there that you'll find a link to the Druva free trial, uh, which you'll be learning about on the webinar today. And then finally, we have our Amazon $300 gift card door prize. I'll announce the winner of that at the end of the live event. If you're watching this on demand, of course, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms can be found there in the handouts tab. And then as I mentioned, we've got our best question prize today. This is for a $50 Amazon gift card. Uh, this um, gift will be announced, or the winner will be announced via email after the event. Uh, and you must still meet, of course, the actual tech media prize policy. So we are doing this, we started this this year, uh, and it's been very successful in, you know, just helping to encourage more questions. So again, keep those questions coming. The purpose of this is to help you to solve your technology challenges around, you know, the best ways to protect your Microsoft 365 environment. And with that, I'm excited now to introduce and bring in our expert presenter. Welcome, Vanessa Tovez, Solutions Architect for Microsoft 365 at Druva. Vanessa, it's great to have you on. Hi, David. Thank you. Excited to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. Take it away. All right. Absolutely. Um, so we'll start with, you know, this this topic of 365, whether you have it, uh, you're going to it, right? You're, you've been there for a year. Um, and for many years as a solution architect, um, I've helped companies to learn how to use Microsoft technologies. And so going even back to the very first version of SharePoint um, uh, and even their BI platforms, you know, I love Microsoft technologies. I've dedicated my career to it, but it's not always easy um, to implement, to adopt, right, to have widespread usage. So um, this is really where I kind of focused my career. And as companies went into Microsoft 365, right, what it was called back in the beginning, Office 365, um, there was a more reliability on this platform, right? It's a SaaS platform, of course, and uh, I saw less and less companies uh, protecting their information, right, their data. So whether they're they're relying upon this messaging or they're just relying upon right the retention or the, the recycle bin or whatnot, um, it was a very different mind or vi different shift from uh, ownership of this content. So that was really one of the reasons why I moved and worked started working for Druva was because for years I spent companies helping to learn how to use it and drive adoption, and now I really felt this this compelling need to help them protect it because there are a lot of pitfalls there, right? A lot of, a lot of areas of loss, potential loss. Um, and the messaging doesn't align with what companies are having to face, right? So these are just some, some, a few of the things that our customers are coming to us very specifically about, right? They have an initiative to be cloud, to have a cloud for strategy, or they are trying to control the cost of their backup storage. They don't want to spend more money in drive space or drives or servers to uh, back up cloud-based applications. Uh, so there's a number of these critical business issues that, um, that are really uh, counter to what you're hearing or uh, maybe even what, what a lot of companies are doing. So when we look at um, why our customers are coming to us, 
right? It's not just about the backup. Um, you know, yes, you have 365 and yes, we have a platform, but there's more to it than what we're trying to do of, of just getting a backup platform. Right? We're looking for areas to, to help these, to help our customers both save money, have reliability, to be able to get back their information when they need to. Right? Because all it takes is one, one little break in this security chain, right? One vulnerability, and in some cases, is, uh, or some cases, uh, the vulnerability isn't even yours. And although it's not um, 365 specific, you know, we look at uh, uh, the solar winds uh, issue from last year. A lot of companies were doing so many different things to protect them from multi-factor authentication, right? And and uh, security training and awareness. There's a lot of investment going into that, but it took a third-party vendor to introduce a you know potential issue. So that's that's what our customers are being faced with today, and probably many of you. Um, and with 365, there are many points of vulnerabilities, and it's not just in one particular area. So that's why this topic, right? Why is it important to back up Microsoft 365? Now, I look at um, uh, the backup and restore uh, very differently. I, being a solution architect, I've been sitting right there next to an admin or across the table from an HR director or communications director or CIO. Um, and their investment goes well beyond that license. You know, the license for just the email, the license for just the apps. What companies begin to do in 365 is transition a lot of manual processes right, and automate those processes. They begin to communicate more effectively through 365, whether it's SharePoint or Teams. So when I look at, um, when, we are, when we talk about what we restore, it's not just about an email and it's not just about a file, but there is an investment in these processes and these solutions. And when you have employees that are, have been trained to go to a particular place and do a particular thing in a certain way within 365, that's an investment both in time or money, um, whether you've had uh, you know, your company hire someone like me or you contract or you have someone else internally that has taken the time to build these solutions. And so there, the investment is, you know, the, I guess the, the question that you ask yourself is uh, how can we get our employees back into their information so the process can continue. So that's what we're also talking about restoring and protecting. Now, depending on where you are in this journey, um, the more and the further along you get, right? The longer you're in there, the more content that you have. And that means there's more exposure. So when we talk about what's in 365 for you today, typically most people start with email. Then they go in and they replace their file, sh their file shares and they get off their VPNs for that access, right? So as you solve more problems with 365, you put more content into it and then, right, you have better adoption, equates to more exposure. I think the number of 17.4% of sensitive data has now gone up extremely. Um, I, I think I've, I've kept this stat in there, but uh, when we talk about sensitive data, it's it's everything, of course, uh, from customer information, account information, you know, anything that comes and falls under regulatory. But all of that information over time, is, they're exposed to these core threats, right? Compromised credentials, compromised endpoints, absolutely cyber attacks and things that come with that. And I believe also users with access, whether that access was intentional or not. Now with 365, I, compliance has existed well before Microsoft 365, but the game is different today. And that's because 365 crosses so many touch points, both across devices and across audiences, whether it's internal or external, right? It crosses so many areas when we talk about this. So the loss of any type of information, be it sensitive or not, has a potential financial or brand impact. I mean, we, there's a number of them. I mean, we're, we're in it today in terms of we are feeling the effect of a, uh, a ransomware attack right today with gas prices. I'm not a customer. I'm not a vendor of uh, Colonial, but we are absolutely feeling that impact as a downstream. 
So this is what we're talking about in terms of what customers are facing when we talk about compliance is there's so many moving parts right to this. And that's where, because 365 can do that, it can cross a lot of barriers. It's prone to, and right in a target of, um, whether it's ransomware or uh, malware, right? Or phishing attacks because of exchange. And, um, and when, when we're here, we have to ask these other questions too, right? Uh, would you pay? I mean, that's what companies are asking themselves today. And I think the stat was like 27% of companies are not paying. That means you have to have some type of uh, readiness plan as to how you can respond to that of not paying. How do you do that, right? What is your SLA? How, do you, how are you gonna prepare for this uh, to answer that question of no, we will not pay? Um, where we start, where our customers start is here, right? They start knowing that their employee emails, their employee files are protected. Right, whether it's protected from their retention policy of one year to another customers of an indefinitely. It's where their SharePoint is protected, where their team's information, their backup is protected. Right, so where are the vulnerabilities now? Where, where are you going to face these? Um, the first one I, I think is the administration of 365. And I say that because most technology departments, right, they have a, a typically a high ratio of support to employee. So 45 to 70 to one, that's like the most, I think, ideal that I've seen. But a lot of the large and enterprise size customers, we're talking, you know, 1,200, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 to one in support of Microsoft 365. So with all of this content and all of your thousands or hundreds and thousands of employees, it's harder to administer, right? It's very wide and it's very deep in its administration. And if you have a person, right, these, your, your maybe your admins are also being asked to be uh, a Salesforce admin, a Jira admin, an Okta admin. So they're spread thin across all of these, which means their ability to go deeper and understand what's on the other side of that button, right, that's the effect, that's what happened to this person. Um, whether he knew it or not, whether it was truly an accident, uh, the reality is there are policies that the administrators of 365 have the ability to affect content that they did not curate and they do not own. And depending on your level of knowledge or the investment that you've made within 365, this is a very painful area. Um, throughout, right, riddled throughout 365 in the apps, you also have areas for loss, potential for loss. So I just picked four of the most common. Having worked with a lot of IT departments and especially around 365, there are very common ones and you probably have a lot of common ones in your ticketing system today. But I cannot rely upon retention to recover anything here. I can't rely upon the recycle bin, right? The platform is sound and ransomware has no effect that didn't cause any of these things. But as a, as a uh, support organization, you're getting tickets. I deleted this column. Well, I don't even know if I deleted it or not, right? Someone deleted a column and in there um, had all this metadata for the legal contracts. And now how do you get that back? Because when you update metadata uh, for a hundred documents or even a thousand on accident, um, you, you're not gonna go in one at a time and restore from a prior version. Right? Or if you've deleted an entire column, there's nothing in the recycle bin for you to go recover. So we'll use these as in our demo and we'll talk more about these. Now, the biggest threat, um, you know, when this came out last year, uh, I think it was last year, uh, the concept of the OneDrive backup and soon to be available for SharePoint, right? This is just files we're talking about. So Microsoft's offering of a desktop, right? Let's back up your desktop. Um, and your, you know, your pictures or your whatever, I think there's three folders in there that you have the option to. And that backup means that you, your employees have to use the OneDrive Sync uh, always. And OneDrive Sync, although, right, is a technology, there's two parts to OneDrive. One is the storage capability, and the other one is a tool that allows you to bring down to your desktop a file structure. A lot of people don't like, especially when you deal with uh, contracts, right? Legal departments, finance departments, they don't like going to the UI. So they're going down to their desktop and 
using OneDrive Sync. That's the biggest point of entry. Right? When we talk about, uh, remember what the top threats were, right? compromised endpoints, compromised credentials. So if those are some of our biggest threats, and of course ransomware and someone clicking on a phishing email and now their computer is exposed, well, you don't have to authenticate when you have, when you're using OneDrive Sync, the files are just there. And because I can also use that with SharePoint, now my HR employee files, or whichever sites I've used OneDrive Sync for. Um, so prior to this backup, right, backup the desktop feature, I would, I would say probably maybe 5% of an organization was using OneDrive Sync. Um, so there's more complexities and I think there's gonna be more flushed out um, and you might experience more of these issues around the OneDrive Sync that uh, I think that's where you're you know, bringing that uh, potential to the desktop. Now, the OneDrive backup that I talked about and, and soon to be available, right? The, the same thing for SharePoint, they're using, it's really files, just files. Um, and in this case, if you were to rely on that, right, it's not an enterprise recovery. So it's not a problem if you have to call someone and say, hey, I need you to go restore back to this point in time, right? You can do it maybe once or two people or three people, but ransomware is not something that you deal with, with just one or two or three people. We're talking, right, it, it affects more uh, depending on what they've done. Um, so when we talk about uh, OneDrive as a backup solution, it is, it is, it does provide that uh, capability, but it's not an enterprise recovery solution for you, right? How can you ensure that the hun, you know, if you go to answer that question of no, we will not pay, how are you going to accommodate that? How are you going to achieve that with calling each and every one of your employees? I don't think so, right? So we have to look at what what you're going to be faced with, especially around ransomware. Uh, so how does Druva uh, protect, help to protect? It starts with the architecture, right? So we're completely 100% cloud-based and we connect into your Microsoft 365 tenant and we do so through Azure, the Microsoft API services, and of course, Azure AD and through your through and connect into your 365 content. All right, we continue on with that with the access to uh, the administrators to manage this as done through a console, management console. And then you also have self-service user uh, restore. And so if you want your employees to be able to restore uh, their emails or their files or have access to that, you can actually uh, create their or assign them those particular rights to do that. And then of course our Druva services now, Druva doesn't or protects more than just 365. So we have the same solution for Google Workspace today as well as Salesforce. So we're gonna to continue to expand out into the areas of cloud-based uh, data recovery, right? Um, but of course your 365 content. Now we ask, when we actually access this content, we start with a global administrator. Yep, I know red flags are going up, but that's okay. Um, we have to use a global admin for the first pass, for the first connection, because we're provisioning both an app and permissions on the Azure side. But after that, you can taper the permissions back down. So you are not tied at all to having an account have um, complete access, right, across areas that they may not even uh, need. Now, when we're connecting to this content, we're connecting to the Azure AD, there's a, uh, the app in the, in the back end of Azure, connects to the Azure AD, and if a new user is added, that automatically gets pushed into uh, the Druva Cloud. So it says, hey, we have a new user, protect that user. And it falls through whatever properties and the paths that you have if you're multi-geo and that person is in the UK, it automatically will know that their data, their email and their OneDrive needs to be backed up into the storage for the UK. Right? To get access to your Exchange and OneDrive and uh, SharePoint Teams, we're using the Microsoft API services. Now, as those mature, we'll add more and more capabilities right, to what we're able to protect for you. Now, when we access this content, we're doing both a read, so we're doing a get, get this information, whatever that is, and then we also push back information. So depending on what action your admins are using, uh, if it's to take a team, 
and everything in it and copy that to a new team, this is why the account also has to have elevated, some elevated privileges to be able to one, create a 365 group, right, and provision that. Uh, so that's our access to the, the content. Now, as when I was doing, you know, as a consultant uh, or even working for a company, what I looked for in backup solutions was flexibility and line item restore, right? The flexibility is very important. Granularity and flexibility. So with uh, Druva, we've got a role-based administration. So not only can you segregate out for a legal team or legal admin a certain level of permissions, um, but we're actually in the process today of doing app based permissions and we'll continue uh, to mature how we do that, right, as a response to our customers. So not everyone needs to be a cloud admin. You might want someone similar to if you have a, a global read, you know, read all uh, in 365, right, you have a view all uh, in here. So we're trying to make that flexibility very familiar to you. Our provisioning we talked about, um, it's cyclical, so it's not as if you're going to have to go and add someone. Um, right, if you're using our skim provisioning or direct to Azure AD, right, you have some options around uh, what users get pushed and, and are being backed up. So it's not an all or nothing. Our profile properties, this is somewhat similar to a 365 group, right? It's a collection of people and those people can follow a set of pro um, properties, right? So here's the scheduling and retention for the executive leadership group. That executive leadership group, I want to back that up, back them up uh, twice a day. I want to back up all of their, um, uh, sorry, their 365. I might want to, you know, maybe you still are, are trailing in on, on Google, right? You've got Gmail or uh, G Drive. Um, you want to back up their devices, both their tablets and their laptops or their desktops. Right? That's the, what the, the profile does. And then you add users to that. So you'd have groups or profiles like executive leadership, maybe your finance and accounting in the UK or, or in Europe, wherever that is. So you can be very flexible with that. Now we talked about, I mentioned this, right? The uh, data residency requirements. If many of you are um, you know, global, right? If you have and fall under different regulatory, uh, we have this capability in place, right? For both users as well as SharePoint and Teams. So as a new user, you create a new user and you've created this path that says, hey, anyone that has, you know, that's in uh, Australia, I want them, when they come into here, they're automatically going to get stored in the AUS uh, West one. So that doesn't change. Right? You set it, set it once and everyone else follows through all of these rules that you want to define. The same thing applies to SharePoint teams. So if that team was created in that region, is you know it has a, a US or Australia right or um, right uh, the UK or uh, South Africa wherever it is uh, you can define where the storage is kept right now we have you know when you know I've talked kind of about this about the solution architecture that I've done and things in SharePoint or things in 365 you don't build solutions in silo so you're not just building something to solve a problem just in SharePoint Right now you've got all of these apps where you can both collect information, save information, right, present uh, information. So solutions are multi-app based. So I think the same kind of applies in terms of uh, what Druva does for Microsoft 365, right? There is a gap of an enterprise recovery, enterprise data protection for Microsoft 365. And believe me, if they had an enterprise data protection plan in terms of backup and recovery, you would absolutely be paying for it. So you would know it before we write anyone else. Uh, so we do fill this gap. And this time that it takes you to begin protecting is literally under 15 minutes. So in under 15 minutes, you could be backing up your users or your SharePoint or your teams. All right, now we're gonna go take a look at um, uh, what it looks like, right, for, uh, what does Druva look like for you? Let me select this. So we'll talk about some of the scenarios, right? Some of this, uh, you know, this is a, a, a pseudo intranet, but ultimately you have use cases that are kind of riddled throughout 365. Uh, one would be restoring site permissions. 
So this is a security model. This the ticket that sound that is going to sound something like this. I used to have access to this yesterday, but I don't today. So not everything has to get restored. Right? You don't have to restore everything to last night's uh, backup. But what you can do is pick and choose exactly what you need to restore. So however something happens like this, someone gets removed, do you have to go and uh, research how to get that back? No. All right, so this is Druva. Right, for 365, we protect Exchange Online, OneDrive, SharePoint, Teams, and public folders. We also protect shared mailboxes as well. So we're going to go into our SharePoint backup. Now, not everything has to be backed up. Right? So you can pick and choose which ones you want to enable or disable. So if I want to disable this one, I can. If I want, if you have one that's deleted and you don't want it around any longer, you can absolutely delete from in here. Right? And every single thing that a person does, an admin, anyone with elevated rights that comes into here, all of that is logged. Very similar to the audit log trail that you see that you see in 365. But if I'm looking for this and I want to go to my restore site permissions, um, this has been backed up. Now the backup for every or the the configuration is I have a configuration of how everything can be defined, right? A default. But then I can also come into this particular site and change that. So I can say for this site, I want to have a custom backup and retention schedule. I want it once a day, twice a day. I want to retain it for you know indefinitely, whatever. I want to have certain uh, file exclusions, right? Um, you know, for this, I don't want executables. I don't want DLLs, whatever that may be that you want to exclude. So now this site, how right here, we've been able to break that, right? Have a have something that's more custom. Now, if I look back in the history of our backups, I can see both the current and in this case, uh, <laughs> I picked one that doesn't have uh, historic ones, but right, this goes back to however far uh, that that retention schedule is told in. So if I come into and look at uh, what we can, right? It's not only just about backup, right? It's about what you're able to restore back into here. So the flexibility comes in with the ability, yes, I can restore the entire thing. I can also just restore the site settings and permissions, which means in this case, that's what I'm going to pick. I can restore libraries, I can restore individual files, or I can even restore the library for uh, the settings for a, a list or a library. So this is that flexibility that we're uh, talking about. In this case, I'm gonna restore, or let me just actually go select this real quick so you can see. So the options that you have to restore, I can restore back to my site, or I can restore back to a different site. And if I do this, if I select a different site, I can either pick one that's existing today, or I can add a new site on the fly. All right, so those are our restore options in there. So in this case, I'm just gonna say, I just need to restore the site permissions, and let's see what we get, All right? So that's gonna go, I'm gonna go to my next scenario. Now, it's so much easier and more visual today to use metadata especially when we have teams and we have all of these uh, various uh, apps. And so because it's easier to use and easier to tag, more people are doing it. And you may not know, but people have done this throughout your tenant. They've already created their own libraries and their own lists, and they've already tagged, you know, used and, and you know, created these tags. And they might even use this for some reporting. Right, because I can export this to Excel and I can make a little dashboard of my contracts library. But the scenario in this case is I can affect content pretty easy in here, right? It's easy to do it. So the easier it is, the more chances that you're going to right, run into that. The other thing that people do is because I want to have a different choice for my stage, they can come in here and add as what they were thinking they were doing. I want to add a another one called right new stage. I've run into this, so I'm bringing these specific ones up because I've seen these. Right? Not necessarily because they're you know high in the sky. So now I've lost that column, or I've done a mass update. So how do I do that? I have nothing in the recycle bin to get that column back. 
or the metadata for the thousands, right? I only have like a, a, a like 20 or so files in here. Contracts libraries have more. I've had some that had 100,000 files because they've kept it since the beginning of time. All right, so let's go back to Druva. And let's go back to our SharePoint and restore once again something more specific. Like, let's see what we've got. And that one was our legal contracts. I think it was called legal contracts. Uh, legal contracts. Is that right? Oh, no. I think I called it something else. Delete column. <laughs> All right, delete column, there we go. All right, so um, one tab that we didn't talk about was our, um, right, our, this activity stream. And every action, every act about who did something, if someone downloaded a file from here, uh, someone uh, restored a file, all of that is logged in here. So when I have, when I have these options, right, I need Lightum, uh, I, or sorry, the, the flexibility to make a choice. I don't need to restore the rest of the site. But I do need both the column and the metadata associated back. So I'm going to restore my documents library. I'm going to store it back to the same site. And I'm going to do an in place restore. And I'm going to overwrite the settings. Right? If I restore as a copy, it's just going to make it a subsite. So that doesn't, that, that doesn't, that's not what I need. I need this particular use case. All right. Now, our last one that we have is, and I've built many of these, these HR employee files. Um, they're dependent upon, right? SharePoint's a great place. SharePoint or Teams, however you interact with this information, is a great place for you to use um, and secure information. So the security model on this is something like an HR manager would say, I need two people to have access to these files and to see everything. I need four people to see the active employees and these other four people to see the terminated employees. So that's called a security model. It's very specific on this site, right? And in this case, in whatever way, however someone did this, what they're doing is they may have affected the permissions, right? So we've got Grady in here, and I want to just, however Grady was removed from this particular thing, or I can just say it was the entire uh, model was uh, removed from there and it now has a it's taking like the default so this is where I'm restoring a security model for a highly sensitive site right? I don't need to restore content so if we come back here into our uh, into our site called HR employee files right and we go back to our backups and what I'm looking for in this case, from a permissions perspective, is I need to restore just these settings. The content wasn't affected, right? But I want to restore the permission settings at that level for my terminated employees. So these are a few of the uh, scenarios that we have. We'll co cover a few other ones in Teams, but let's go take a look at, at any and all of these. So did I recover? Did I restore? So yes, Adele is back, right? Helped us take it done. Thank you, next one. Uh, my legal contracts, right? The field that I, the column that was affected was called stage. Great, remember what we talked about, what I talked about early on is that it's not about restoring the file often. It's sometimes it's about restoring the process. And this library was dependent upon uh, this stage column to route itself through its process. So the process has been restored, right? Yes, we're back in place. This one, our terminated employees, let's go see if our permission model is back intact because on highly sensitive sites, as, the, as an admin, is, where an admin is concerned, what you want to make sure is that your customers, right, the HR manager, feels and knows that the model that's in place is secure, that they can always rely upon that. Now, as uh, anyone that works in help desk or even you know an admin, you're not aware often of who did something and why. Why was a security model made this way? Well, the ticket isn't about why, it's about it's broken. So you get to go put it back in place as it was yesterday. Right? so this is where we talk about um, the scenarios 
I oftentimes I don't it, it it's true I don't it's not that I don't care it's uh it I just need to put it back to how it was yesterday if I can do that I, we accomplish our goal in that so now we've got these scenarios that we talked about just in SharePoint right um, we have others and we can take a look at what we're looking at with our um, with the rest of our um, with the rest of Druva so we come back to right this is where a customer this is where you are going to be able to say yes we are protected right how many exchange online emails how many SharePoint sites how many teams are being protected and we also know that they're being stored those backups are being stored in AWS in the in the exact regions that were defined so with Exchange Online and the users in there, you both, you can still drive additional compliance through into your backups, right? I wanna place this person on legal hold, right? So if I want to come in here and look at, we'll go look at mine in particular, and I wanna restore that, I've got Exchange and OneDrive. Now, how did that, how did we, how did I determine that that was being assigned? Now remember, I talked to you about profiles, right? The profiles are the things that are gonna allow you some really good flexibility in protecting with specific properties. So the profile of the UK, Accounting UK has two users. It's protecting four different cloud apps, right? Our technology one has four users, right? We can put a quota on any one of these. If you have an executive leadership group or senior leadership group, you can have different properties in there. So let's go take a look at what that is. So we can define what devices, which I have no devices on in this one, um, <laughs> what cloud apps. So in this case, I want to schedule, I also want to change the schedule. I want it to be done twice a day, right? Or once a day. I want to retain it for however many days, or I put zeros for uh, right indefinite. Right, so these are the, the flexibility of what we're doing. Yes, you can define a default, but you can also change the, how a particular profile functions and the users that are involved with that. So if I want to go back to and say, what else can I do as a uh, with this profile? Right, I can log certain things, but I can also assign whether these users can actually uh, log in and have self-service restore. And so there's a, a number of the things that we're talking about in terms of flexibility for your ability to say, hey, this is how I want Accounting UK to function or to, to be protected, right? Those are, our, those are our profiles. The role-based administration that we talked about, and I can have a number of users that are in here, but very specific, you know, assigned with specific roles. So there's out of the box rules, or you can create your own rules and assign different permissions to that, right? So, uh, different levels of um, access, and then assign those roles to a particular user. So having role-based administration to support what you need, right? Not everyone needs to see or act or do the same thing. That becomes, right, a very important capability for our customers. The reporting that we have here, if you want from an administrative perspective to be able to say, I want to see all failed backups, or I want to see anything that was, uh, any one of our preserved users, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, right? The reporting that's in here, I can actually run it on demand, or I can actually schedule it to show up in my email once a day, or however, whatever the frequency is. Uh, so there's a lot of visibility in terms of what is happening inside your backup, right? Inside your data protection. Now we'll go back over to our users again. Now that we know that a user belongs to a particular profile, we'll take a look at the, uh, the both exchange. So if I'm looking at a particular user and I'll use mine as an example, right, I can restore my exchange and I've got the point in time, right? I can go back in time, all the way back to October of 2020 or however long I've been protecting this user. Restores can be done or with, with, your, with the restore capability. You can also um, download that as a PST. Right? So you have a lot of functionality in here to accommodate what you're needing. If you have um, employees that have left the organization and you're no longer holding that license, you bring that, you back them up, you keep their email and their OneDrive files in here and you preserve that user so that you can gain access to this information when you need to. And you don't need to hold on to any 
you know, users from, you can, sorry, you're still holding on to these users, but you don't need to keep them in your 365. So from a flexibility perspective, I can restore entire folders. I can restore a particular file, right? I can also search for, um, let's go search for something. Let's go 80 active. Uh, we'll go search for Azure. Right, so I can search throughout this email and I can restore either back in place to the same user. I can restore to a different user account, or of course I can download that file. And so there's that flexibility um, of the restores for both. It's very similar from one uh, area of 365 protection to the next, right, for users. If I want to restore my OneDrive in here, it's the same thing. I can restore back to the entire, right, to a OneDrive, that user's OneDrive, or to a different OneDrive um, account and retain the share settings if I need to. So all of the restoring that we have down to this file level does retain permissions. So if a file has been shared with person X and that's restored, that same permissions have been uh, maintained, right? So I can also then keep going down with that same item level restore if I need to, with the same search capability, all right? So, you know, it gets kind of boring sometimes because it, it's just the, um, the functionality ends up being very simple and, very, and the same from one area to the next. So we restore, right? We can restore Exchange, OneDrive. I don't have public folders in this uh, dev tenant, but that functions the same. So shared mailboxes or public folders. Those are also things that you may have today, especially if you've migrated uh, from an Exchange online or Exchange on-prem on-premise server. Uh, Microsoft Teams functions pretty much the same exact way as we had with SharePoint. I have a global configuration to say that this is the storage by default I want all new SharePoint or all new Teams to go into. Right? This tenant isn't uh, configured for multi-geo, but if it were, I could also just have the automatic settings. I can change right to twice a day, down to once a day. Now, a lot of things aren't saved in uh, Teams. Right, there's not a lot of stuff in Teams that are being uh, saved chat, right? Attachments, links, uh, settings, channels, right? Uh, more definitions. The files typically are somewhere else, right? They're usually either on your OneDrive or on a on a SharePoint. Uh, so these aren't real big in terms of size. Um, for this particular, you know, team, right? We have the same ability capability. I want to change this team because this team has a lot of activity. They have a lot of chat all throughout the day. So I wanna customize this particular one. I wanna back them up twice a day. And I also wanna keep their, right, keep this content forever if it's uh, picking up on, the, on your default. So I've defined that this particular team is going to act differently and be backed or protected differently. I can look back at my history of backups in the same way, right, and go back in time. Right. I want to restore a channel that was deleted or a channel that's no longer in the recycle bin, whatever that may be. So if I come back here to, let's go back to my, I should probably uh, update my, my, my demo. <laughs> um, same thing applies for my team, right? I can restore to the same team. I can restore to a different team. And I, if, it, if it's already existing, I just type it in or I can add a new team on the fly. And what gets restored is both your settings, your channels, uh, the chat that was in there, right? All of those things that are, uh, are specific, uh, the files that are associated to those channels, all of that, uh, that can get restored into a new team, right? And the same level of granularity when we're looking at a particular team or a particular channel, I can restore the chat, the conversations, the associated files, Hopefully I picked one with, with actual, yeah, perfect. Um, and of course the wiki. So conversations, there's a little caveat for conversations, your chat. So the, the API currently today does not allow for a chat to be, uh, to, to be pushed back into the actual uh, channel, right? So I cannot restore uh, this particular chat. Oh yeah, let me go see if I can find a chat somewhere. Uh, I can't restore this particular chat back into um, 
into the channel. So what do we do? How does that, what does that look like? All right, so I'm gonna go into a backup and into this. Let's, hopefully I have some chat in there. All right, no, no conversations. <laughs> Sorry about this. Anyway, uh, the restore of these of the chat comes down at their HTML files, right? The, so they could get restored back into back into the actual library itself uh, as individuals. So if you have, you know, every single thread is a, a line item in here. Um, and I'm gonna, I know we have some time, so I'm gonna see. I know I have one in here. Um, so we do restore as an HTML file. You can download that file. So if let's think about the scenario of compliance, right? Legal is looking for all the chat for a particular team. You can go into that, um, into the conversations or restore that entire team to a new team and provide your legal with access to that, right? Read only access to that. Uh, you can also download particular chat, um, you know, based upon your search requirements and uh, send those files right to your uh, HR or direct them to in right to these teams so that they can go do some self-service as well and find the information. All right, so we've gone through quite a bit, right? We've gone through um, Exchange, OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams, uh, and I think let's go see. I think that's really a, a good stopping point. Um, there's a lot of use cases, lots of points of vulnerability in 365. It's moving, right? There's constant development in there. But other other than, you know, yes, we have to deal with ransomware and the threat of ransomware. Uh, yes, we have to deal with what happens when, you know, there's malware on our computer or, or we have phishing, right, emails where uh, things get embedded in someone's OneDrive because the OneDrive sync is, is there and there's no, right, prompt for authentication. Uh, so there's a lot of little scenarios that we, have to be able to protect against. I love, uh, I really do love this platform. I love Microsoft 365 and but of course Druva, um, but you know, 365, it's big. So if you don't have the support, the administration, right? If you don't have the ability to use a lot of these, uh, you know, even use a lot of the security and compliance features. And even if you did, there's a lot of culture that gets in the way of, um, right? The adoption of some of these, uh, security mechanisms. So what can we do to protect uh, and be able to recover from incidents, both, you know, intentional or unintentional? And within 15 minutes, you can be protecting your Microsoft 365, right? That's one of the things that you can do. Start protecting your 365. All right, I'm going to jump back here and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And let's go take a look at our questions at this point in time. Absolutely. Yeah. Great presentation. Great demo. Uh, we got a lot of questions coming in for you, Vanessa, from the audience. Um, I love this comment here where, uh, where to go? Uh, oh, Troy said, I, I have to admit that I'm geeking out right now. So a lot of good feedback <laughs> on your presentation and Sweet. demo there. Thank you for that. Um, we'll just Absolutely. start with, yeah, let's start with this question. Um, a basic one here, what does Druva cover for Microsoft 365 when it comes to protection? Yeah, um, right, Druva, Druva's cloud protection, our data protection platform, absolutely where 365 is concerned, exchange emails, shared mailboxes. I also believe with uh, some PowerShell, we can actually uh, protect your resources. However, that's right, uh, I'll leave that to someone else. Your public uh, folders, uh, your um, OneDrive, your users' OneDrives, uh, SharePoint and Teams, actually, and in development today is, or sorry, in our, right, in our uh, uh, development of, I think in the next couple weeks or months, is Planner. So we're going to be constantly adding to our platform. You might wake somewhat, how the experience that you have with Microsoft, you wake up tomorrow and you get a whole new feature. Uh, so you might wake up tomorrow and you get a whole new, right, you get Planner. <laughs> Or stream after that. So, I like it's a good that. question. Yeah. Another question here. Do you have? So I know you mentioned that you need admin to set it up, and then once it's set up, uh, you don't need admin anymore. Is that correct? 
you don't need a global admin. What you do is you that account, you just taper, you're going to taper the permissions back. Um, we're working on our UI for that to be a lot easier for you, uh, but we do have a way for you to actually say, these are the permissions uh, that we are granting right to this particular account. So it does start with a global admin, but then it does, it gets tapered back. Because think about what you just saw in this demo, um, right? The restore back to self, that's not a big deal because I just need uh, the ability to add content right, or edit on, in a team or SharePoint, but the restore to a new location, to an existing location, right, I need the ability to, the same thing there, I need to be able to add or whatever to any of these other teams or groups. Um, but the last one is the one where that, you know, your rights change. I'm going to create a team on the fly and restore this. So this is where the account that is executing these calls has to have those permissions. So yeah, I understand, believe me, the the, the global admin conundrum because a lot of companies, uh, a lot of vendors have that, uh, but that is one of the, the things that we are working on is, right, we just want the least amount of privilege that we need because we don't need everything. Great point, great point. There's a couple questions here about um, the pricing model, if you can kind of give us an overview of uh, what the model is for that. Yes. Um, you know, I am not the sales per I'm not the pricing person. So uh, if you wanted to get better uh, numbers on pricing, you can either visit our website uh, or right, you can actually uh, do the free trial um, or set up a, a, a demo and they can go into more specifics uh, about the pricing. So it Got could it. be variable. Yeah. Okay. And then do you support storing user information in different locations? Oh yeah, um, we talked about that. Uh, so if you have, um, as an example, someone in Germany and you're here, your corporate is in the US and you also have someone in the in Australia, uh, what, that, what you do is you create, set up the different uh, storage locations. Um, I think there's 26 all throughout the world, something like that. So you define those storage locations and you say in this, right in this mapping, you say AUS, it goes to, uh, this particular storage location, which is located in the AWS cloud, right? Data, that's where your backups are going to be in Australia. Um, so once you, one, create the storage locations, and then two, just define those, that, that, that particular mapping, right? AUS or the US, or some people even have, right? They want to even be more specific about count the CCPA. So they have a totally separate location for just um, employees there in California. So data residency, we have some flexibility around that uh, to help you accommodate that. Excellent. And then uh, what's the flexibility around how long I can keep my information uh, of, of someone that has left the company? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Actually, I, I don't think I, I think I said I was gonna talk about it, but I didn't. Uh, so let's say you have a hundred employees today and those 100 employees, what Druva does is we give you 10% of your uh, your active user license, right? So you have 10 users that you can have as what we call preserved. Uh, they don't, you don't have a license in 365 for this user anymore. You might've converted them to a shared mailbox or whatever it is. So an active user today in Druva is, uh, they leave the company, you transition them to a preserved user, whether you just move them into a, a new profile or some, however you want to manage that. Um, and that user now is preserved. So you have a, a, a quota that we give you uh, where it doesn't cost, it's no additional cost, but I think after, uh, after you've gone over that, you have a license, um, you might have a license. I think that the cost of the license is different, uh, less expensive than because it's right, not active. They're not, we're not actively doing any more with that user other than holding that and maintaining it. So uh, we refer to that as a preserved user. So if you talk to someone just, you know, on our side in our sales team or uh, who's giving you a demo, just say, can you tell me about preserved users? Okay. Okay. Good tip. And yeah. then another question, what about um, protecting policies. Uh, there's a question here around that. Uh, so com security and compliance rules or mail, mail flow rules. Can Druva protect any of that in Office 365? 
Um, mail flow rule, no. Uh, the security and compliance policies, uh, the things that you actually set up in the, in, in the back end of the admin console, we're not actually actively protecting uh, the actual policies. Uh, that's still in right the Microsoft 365 service realm. Uh, so if you have a new policy and you affect that policy, right, that's something that we aren't currently protecting on the administration side. Um, the mail flow rules, we are not protect. I, I can check on this, but I want to say no, we are not protecting the mail flow rules. Um, but that's, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to find out more about that one too. Okay. There's another question here. Can you elaborate on what you mean when you say that OneDrive is not enterprise backup? Yeah, OneDrive backup, it is absolutely a backup mechanism. As a, it's a user tool more than anything else. As an individual, I might want to go, I want to go back to my file, you know, uh, last week and maybe I deleted it. It's not in my recycle bin whatever, I can't find it. Uh, there's always some complexities around the deleting. Um, but when I talked about it from a, from a restore perspective, um, I look at it especially as an organization's ability to respond uh, in a broader manner and ensure that not just one person, but 50 or 100 uh, can be restored back to the same point in time prior to Right, the um, prior to a uh, a particular hack or breach or whatever, or the, where a virus was introduced, um, right? It's that's the enterprise piece, and I, I guarantee you, if there was, if there absolutely was an enterprise um, backup uh, platform or solution for 365, it would cost you five dollars a user. I mean, or whatever it is, right? Because it's not it. It's not a service, right? This is just an end user feature. So could your users go back and do that? Yes, they can go back and restore to uh, last Thursday. There's no doubt that they have the ability. I think, I don't know if the, the days are 30 or 90 now. Um, I think I read 90. And that same feature is gonna apply to, you know, SharePoint soon enough. They're gonna allow you to, to be able to restore some part of it, but the files, right, a file. Um, you know, this is where I talk about the enterprise um, aspect of it, right? Enterprise versus the one-off and um, how can you respond, right, to an enterprise attack or an enterprise answer to ransomware of saying we are not going to pay, but we have to restore every one of our users' information back to a particular point in time. Um, you know, how are you going to do that globally with you just call up every single person and say, I want you to go back in and hopefully you get this right right think about asking your to be honest your ceo to go in there and do his uh or asking any one of your other uh right in leadership people of leadership there there's sometimes um no offense to anyone on here but so there's sometimes the the hardest stuff to go and say go do these things manually you know that's that's this is where i talk about the difference between the user backup and an enterprise backup and restore Got it. Okay. Good clarification. Thank you. I mean, we're starting to run out of time here in our webinar slot. We've got one minute left uh, and I see 40 questions. So obviously you've, you've hit a nerve. You've gotten the audience excited, uh, tons of interest and uh, questions around exactly how this works. So we're going to have to take some of those offline and get back to you after the event. But uh, Vanessa, I want to thank you so much for your excellent presentation and demo. Yeah, you're welcome. And what I'll do is I'll take these questions and we can, you know, respond back to these. And I think we have emails, so I'll respond back to and get these ones. Like the very first question, do we uh, cover Google Workspace? Yes, the exact same way we cover 365. So uh, look for these responses and I think I'll just respond and send it back to everyone in the same email, so. Excellent. All right, yeah. thank you, Vanessa. And thank you to the uh, team there at Druva for supporting the event today. I want to remind everyone, make sure that you check out in the handouts tab. The first link right there is the Druva free trial. You can click on that. That'll take you to druva.com where you can sign up for the free trial of the solution that you just saw here in action to better protect your Microsoft 365 environment. Before we go, I want to announce the winner 
of our Amazon $300 gift card. This is going to Derek Densmore of California. Congratulations, Derek Densmore of California. And we'll reach out to our best question prize winner as well. Thank you everyone for joining us on the webinar today. I hope you learned a lot and have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.